Amen. We thank the Lord for another opportunity to be back here again to learn more of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, give him honor. Thank him for his son Jesus. And thanking him for the precious gift of the Holy Ghost, which is our comfort, our God, and our keeper. I give honor to you all as well today. Thank the Lord for you being back. As you can see, this is uh, a continuation from last week, marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And this is part two. And uh, we looked at it last week according to the scriptures and seeing that uh, what's done in the ignorance and the darkness of our heart, the hardness of our hearts, and when we're in darkness, the Lord forgives. Uh, but now we're going to go and look at afterwards now the church being established after Jesus Christ has come and now he's died and uh, the New Testament covenant is now in effect because he has shed his blood. The Bible says that a testament is of force after men are dead. And that's why Jesus in the, at the Lord's Supper told the disciples, this is the New Testament covenant in my blood. We thank the Lord for this opportunity. I'm going to begin in uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'm going to look at what marriage looks like now and how it should be according to scriptures and the things that had to be dealt with when the church is being established because there are people that are coming out of darkness into the marvelous light of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we'll see that Jesus didn't deal with unequally yoked marriages, but the Apostle Paul did. And it is yet the word of God because we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and at verse number 1. It says, Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. They wrote to Paul asking questions concerning marriage or concerning being single. He said, it's good for a man not to touch a woman. Then he says in verse two, nevertheless, to avoid fornication, a sexual sin. And particularly we, uh, fornication is an umbrella for all sexual sin. But today we understand fornication as, you know, being physically involved with somebody that's not your spouse. Uh, but Adultery is fornication. Uh, homosexuality is fornication. Bestiality is fornication. Pedophilia is. All of those things fall up under the umbrella of fornication. So Paul says, you know, it's good. Verse 1, concerning the things wherever you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. This is to avoid fornication. So if you have the desire, burning desire, and attraction toward uh, the opposite sex, he says, get married. Then he goes on to say, that's to avoid fornication. He goes on to say in verse three, let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, which is affection, and it is what is due. Then he says, and likewise also the wife unto the husband. A man's, a husband's responsibility is to his wife to, to satisfy her, to satisfy that fleshly desire. And likewise, it is the woman's responsibility, the wife's responsibility to satisfy her husband's physical desires. That's scripture. Let's go on. Look what he says in verse four. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. So he's saying the wife does not have authority over her body, 
the husband has authority over her body, over his wife's body. Then he goes on to say, and likewise also the husband hath not power over his own body, but the wife. In other words, a man can say that his wife's body belongs to him, and the, womp, the wife can say that my husband's body belongs to me. Hmm? You can say that because this is what the scriptures say. Many people and many marriages have a, uh, an impasse here or a, a, there's a fight right here. But when you're in the Lord Jesus Christ, shouldn't be any issues in your marriage that you cannot, by the grace of God, deal with. If you live according to the word of God, you'll be fine in your marriage. Both people living according to the word of God be fine in your marriage. Wonderful Savior. Look what he goes on to say behind this. You don't have authority over your body, but your wife does, men. And women, you don't have authority over your own body, but your husband does. Look at verse 5. Defraud ye not one the other. You know what that mean? Don't deny each other. It's called defraud. Fraud. It's a crime against God. He said, don't do that. Defraud ye not one the other. Then he says, except it be with consent for a time. That means both have to agree that we're going to abstain from one another for a period of time. And there's a reason why the scripture says Except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. So, a man decides that he's going to go on a fast. He don't just up and go on a fast. Because when you're on a fast, you're denying yourself. Wonderful Savior. So he can't just say, I'm going on a fast. You have a wife, brother. So what you do is go to your wife and you say, Baby, I'm going to go on a fast. Is that all right with you? And she can say, yeah, I'm going to go on a fast with you. You see, more than likely that would be the case with two believers. Hmm? Two spirit-filled believers married to one another. Or she can say, well, can you start your fast tomorrow? Because I was kind of, I'm interested in seeing you tonight. <laughs> Wonderful Savior. And you know what he should do? Put his fast off until tomorrow because he has a responsibility. His body does not belong to himself. His body belongs to his wife and she must consent to him going on this fast. But of course, she's saved. She, she wants him to fast too. But she may say, can you put it off till tomorrow? Because tonight I want us to come together and tomorrow you start your fast and I'll go on the fast with you. That's perfectly okay and well within the lines of scripture, done like that. And vice versa, likewise, the wife says she want to go on a fast. And, and this is when we will uh, uh, part of abstain from one another for a time for fasting and prayer. And the husband say, well, can you wait till tomorrow night? Because I want us to come together tonight. And she, she waits until tomorrow night wonderful Savior, to go on the fast, and they go on the fast together. Now, look at what the Lord says through the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth about after the fast and then prayer, and prayer, prayer is over. Look what he says. Start at the beginning of verse 5 again. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for time, just for a period of time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So now you've, you've abstained for a while and now the physical desire is built up. He said come together again so that you're not going to be tempted by Satan. Because Satan will send a pretty little thing your way or a hunk of a man your way. While your desires are built up. No, come right back to your husband, women, wives, and husbands come right back to your wives. When the fast and his prayer is over, y'all come together again. Wonderful Savior, that the devil don't tempt you. Then look at verse 6. 
He says, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. He's not talking about the few verses that we just read about don't defraud one another. Those are strict, those are definite commandments. What he's talking about when he says in verse six, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. He's talking about whether you get married or not. It's up to you whether you get married or stay single and serve the Lord. And we'll see that verse six, that's what verse six is talking about, because when we go into verse seven, we'll have better clarity. So verse six, but I speak this by permission and not of commandment. Verse seven says, for I would, meaning because, for means because. What you do that for? For means because. He said, for I would that all men were even as myself. Paul was a single man. He never had a wife. So he said, this is by permission, whether you be married or not. But he says, if you cannot contain yourself and your, your fleshly desires, your sexual desires, he's saying, let every man have his own wife and every woman her own husband. But this is up to you by permission. It's not a commandment that you must get married or it's not certainly not a commandment that you have to stay single. He said this is per by permission. It's up to the individual. But th it is a gift from God to be able to live a life of celibacy. Wonderful Savior. So that's why he says in verse seven, for I would that all men were even as myself. He said it would be good. I liked it if everybody was like me celibate and just serve the Lord. You don't have a husband to look after a husband to satisfy. You don't have a wife to satisfy. You can give all your time over to the Lord. Because the Bible lets us know that those that are married, they got to care for the things of this world because they got somebody that they belong to and that they uh, 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 owe uh, due benevolence. Wonderful Savior, do service. Well, bless his name. He says, for I would in verse seven that all men were even as I myself. Then he says, but every man hath his proper gift of God. One after this manner and another after that. Everybody doesn't have that gift. That's why it's by permission, whether you get married or not. But if you get married, you got to give unto your spouse what is due them. If they want you, you can't say no. Man, you can't have a headache every night. Women, you can't have a headache every night. If your spouse has a headache, then you can be understanding and say, well, okay, I understand you're not feeling well tonight, but we're not going to have this headache every night now because you don't belong to yourself. You belong to me. The wife can say that to her husband and the husband can say that to his wife. And with both in the Lord and truly want to live according to the word of God, we're not going to let these headaches get in the way. And we're not going to use intimacy as a weapon, not in the body of Christ. If someone is doing that, they are out of order in their marriage. God ain't called for that nonsense. That's the way of the world. Using it as leverage. Wonderful. You give the devil room to operate in your marriage when you operate like that. Oh, bless his name. It's a shame that the divorce rate in the so-called so body of Christ is equal to the divorce rate of the world. Because many uh, Christian marriages are are operating like marriages of the world. And we have the guideline here in the scriptures how the Christian marriage should operate. Those who say that they are children of God, followers of Jesus Christ. Look what he says, verse seven, for I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God. One after this manner, some can be celibate and live single lives serving the Lord, and another after that. Then he says, I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. You're unmarried or you're a widow, it's good that you stay just like me, celibate. Then he says, but if they cannot contain, let them marry. See, it is by permission, whatever you feel like, you need to do stay single or get married. It's up to you. It's by permission. 
verse 9 he says but if they cannot contain meaning if they cannot contain their uh, physical desires but if they not, cannot contain let them marry for it is better to marry than to burn and what he's talking about is better to marry than to burn with passion you see and go ahead and get married to someone who is also in the Lord. The passion can be satisfied and you're good in the sight of God. But if you are burning with passion and you won't get married, he said, you're not doing what it takes to avoid fornication. And fornication, unrepented of, will cause a person to burn, end up burning in the lake of fire wonderful savior but here he's saying it's better to marry than to burn with passion with physical desires verse 10 and unto the married i command listen to paul's language here and unto the marriage i command then he said yet not i but the lord let not the wife depart from her husband what paul is saying here we have what the lord has said concerning the married he said this is what the lord has said he said this is not just from me it's from the lord it's on record he said and unto the married i command yet not i but the lord let not the wife depart from her husband we see that in matthew 19. he's talking to those who are in christ now these were the corinthians they were gentiles but now they're in the lord and he's saying, don't divorce. Wonderful Savior. Same thing I was saying in part number one. The Samaritan woman at the well had had five husbands in St. John 4. Jesus says, go get your husband. She says, I don't have one. Jesus said, you have rightly said, you told the truth. Then he went on to say, for you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. In this you have truly said you see he's talking to someone who does not know the law someone who is outside of God wonderful Savior in Romans 7 we see where Paul says using marriage as an example how we are to be dead to sin so that we can be married to Christ he said the law had dominion over man he said I'm speaking to those who know the law in Romans chapter 7 verses 1 and two and going down through there he's dealing with the ones who know the law the corinthians at one point in time they didn't know the law they were corinthians not hebrews but now they are saved this is the church now in the lord jesus christ that is at corinth and he's saying y'all in the lord now no divorce same thing i said last week oh bless his name you can argue, but the word of God is right. <laughs> oh, bless his name. Then he says, verse 10, again, and unto the married, these married folks in Corinth that are now in the body of Christ, the church at Corinth, and unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. Then he look at verse 11. But, and if she depart, if there's a separation, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Then he says, and let not the husband put away his wife. But now look at verse 12. Remember in verse 10, he said, this is a commandment, yet not I, but the Lord said that in verse 10. But look at verse 12. He said, but to the rest, who is the rest, y'all? Who is the rest? The rest are the ones who are in unequally yoked marriages. One is saved, one is not. This church, you got all kind of people coming in out of darkness into light and you have situations that the Lord Jesus Christ did not deal with in his earthly ministry. Because in his earthly ministry, he was dealing with the Jews. But he said that his apostles were going to establish his church. And in the establishment of his church in Matthew 16, he says he's going to give the keys to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. This is talking about what is forbidden 
in the church because you got to be in the church in order to get into heaven. If you're not in the body of Christ, you don't make it into the kingdom of God. These are the keys to the kingdom that he told Peter, I'm giving it to you and whatever you bind, because he said, up on this rock, I'm going to build my church in Matthew 16. And the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So the church is going to be built, but in this church being built, you have people that are going, this thing opening up to the Gentiles, people coming from all walks of life, having done all kinds of things before they come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and coming in with all type of situations that must be dealt with because salvation is being offered to them all. And so through the apostles, according to Acts, let me show you Acts chapter one. And we're coming back to first Corinthians chapter seven and at verse number 12. Acts chapter one. How we know, even though Paul says the Lord didn't say this, he said, but I'm saying it. But we know it's the word of the Lord. How? Acts one and one. Luke wrote the book of Luke, of course, and he wrote the book of Acts. And both times he's writing to a man by the name of Theophilus. Wonderful Savior. Acts 1 and 1, the former treaty or the former letter. Have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up? So he's saying, I've already written to you in the former treaty or the former letter, which was the book of Luke. Everything that happened unto the Lord Jesus Christ was taken up. So verse two, unto the day in which he was taken up. Now he's writing Theophilus again. After that, he, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So whatever the apostles said was given to them through the Holy Ghost by way of the Lord, by way of the Holy Ghost from the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ gave all of his apostles commandments from heaven through the Holy Ghost that was in them, guiding them and leading them to build his church. All right. Back to first Corinthians chapter seven. Remember in verse 10, he was talking to the married. And he's talking to the married, saved folks at the church in Corinth. And in that verse 10, he says, and unto the married, I command. Then he says, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband. Now look at verse number, okay, verse 11. But in if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. And let not the husband put away his wife. Now, verse 12, he said, but to the rest, speak I, then he said, not the Lord. What Paul is saying is the Lord has not spoken on this, but I'm speaking on it now. And we just saw that what the apostles were given were commandments from the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost. But the Lord himself, before he ascended on high, when he was doing his earthly ministry, he didn't speak on unequally yoked marriages. But the church is being built now and whatever is bound on earth shall be bound in heaven, meaning the Lord is going to give commandments as to what can go on in this church that's to be loosed. And what's to be bound, what cannot go on. In other words, the parameters and the guidelines for being in the body of Christ was given to the apostles by the Lord Jesus Christ through the Holy Ghost in the building of his church. Wonderful Savior. Verse 12. But to the rest speak I. Not the Lord. A lot of people say, well, see, Paul admitting right there that this ain't from the Lord. You've got to have understanding. With all thy getting, get understanding. If your understanding contradicts scripture in any other part of the Bible, then you need to understand that there's a, there's a contradiction in your understanding, not in the scriptures. Just like I was pointing out uh, with Matthew 19, when the Lord Jesus said, if any man divorce his wife and marry another, he commits adultery. He was talking to the Jews. But when he came to the woman of Samaria, he said, you rightly said you don't have a husband. Paul in Romans 7 and 1 said, I'm speaking to the Jews, those that know the law. You see, you got to have understanding. Wonderful Savior. Verse number 12. 
but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother, a brother is a saint. Paul said a brother. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, this is a saved man with an unsaved wife, an unbelieving wife. He says, if in, but to the start of the beginning of verse 12, but to the rest speak I, not the Lord. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. If she want to stay, he said, don't put her away. She's unbeliever, but don't put her away. If she want to stay. You can win this woman to the Lord and vice versa. A saved woman with an unsaved man. He pleased to dwell. Stay right there. Look at verse 13. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, that woman is a sister in the Lord. She saved, which hath an husband that believeth not. She has an unsaved husband. And if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. And that means don't divorce him. Verse 14 says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Then he says, else were your children clean, but now are they holy. It's not that because the mother or father is saved that the children are holy or that the spouse is sanctified is that your light will shine in that home and draw your husband if he's unsaved or your wife if she's unsaved it will draw and your children it will draw them to the lord wonderful savior they'll be brought up in the admonition of the lord mom and dad is saved the children are trained up in the way that they should go and they can be brought up to be holy well bless his name he says uh Verse 14 again, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. Then he says, but if the unbelieving depart, he said, let them depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. He said, if they want to go, let them go. Then he says, a brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Wonderful Savior. Verse, I want to look at something real quick. There are many that will say that that in verse 15 is saying that you're not obligated to perform your duties to the person the unbeliever that departed you're not you don't have to uh, perform your duties anymore it's, it's, it, they say that it's not saying that you are free to marry again but in the translation it does give a definition that allows for divorce it says separation, but it also has divorce in there as well. And <clears throat> the Lord God, he's the God of all flesh. And there are many who are in this situation. They maybe started off, both of them were unsaved. And one got saved and now uh, there's a division in the home. You know, Lord Jesus even spoke of this. He said, think not that I come to send peace on earth. He said, I come not to send peace, but a sword. And I come to set a man at variance of, uh, with them of his own household, the father against the, the son and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a man's foes or a man's enemies shall be they of his own household. Uh, Jesus Christ was saying, when salvation comes into a home and one person uh, receives the salvation of the Lord, the grace of God that saves by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then now you have people that are of two different spirits working in the house, serving two different masters. One is serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The other one is serving the devil. And so there will be a division in the home. 
but I am a witness as to what God can do when a man or a woman of God stands on the word of God and by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ live out what um, the Lord has called us to live and their spouse gets saved. I'm not one who advocates for divorce. No way, no how. Wonderful Savior. I believe that the Lord can deliver any situation. Uh, the Bible says that the name of the Lord Jesus Christ is above every name. If we'll hold fast, the Lord will deliver. Just make sure we're found holding fast and you do everything that you can to win your unsaved spouse to the Lord. Wonderful Savior. Verse 16, he goes on to say, for verse 15 again, but if the unbelieving depart, it said, let him depart. Of course, you can't make anybody stay with you. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. Now, I want to look at something else here. Well, bless his name. It says in that word, that word bondage, verse 15. But if I'm believing the part, let him depart. Our brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. It says that uh, it's not under obligation, but also says concerning divorce. But that's not what we're looking for. Because look what verse 16 says. It says at the end of verse, verse 15, but God hath called us to peace. So we want to always go after what God has called us to peace. We're not looking for a way out. We're looking for a way in to the kingdom of God. We're looking to please the Lord with everything that we know how. Wonderful Savior. The Lord will change a person. The Lord, will, even, even if the Lord doesn't change the person, the Lord will develop you and make you stronger in him. Oh, bless his name. Oh, bless the name of the Lord. Verse 16 says, For what knoweth, the, knowest thou, O wife? See, this is why the Lord call us to peace. Don't run after the divorce if it's an unbeliever and they want to leave. He said, For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? See, it's a possibility they might be saved. So we don't want to kill the possibility. Keep letting your light shine. You've come to the Lord. If he can save you, he can save them. Well, bless his name. Verse 17 says, But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. So if the Lord distributed you the gift where you can be single, walk in that. You can be celibate, walk in it. Or if it's for you to get married, do so to avoid fornication. He said, if you can't contain yourself, it's best to marry than to burn. Verse 17, but as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. And then he said, and so ordain I in all churches. I want to look at uh, Ephesians chapter 5. Wonderful Savior. Ephesians chapter 5. There's some understanding need to be given over here. There's something I came across here within the past week or two. Well, bless his name. It's a lot going on in marriages today. Uh, marriages between people who say that they know the Lord. A marriage that is governed by the word of God will be a su successful marriage. Um, just say something here personally, and I believe it'll help others. When me and my wife uh, got married, we've been married, it'll be 12 years this year. And it has been wonderful. It has gotten 
better and better and better because we're both serving the Lord and growing in the grace and the knowledge of him. No place I'd rather be than in my marriage other than the kingdom of God. And I thank the Lord for that. I thank the Lord for my wife. She's a God-fearing woman. And I am dead set on being a God-fearing man and living everything that I know according to the word of God. But here's what I said to my wife when we first got together. And we first got married. I said, it's not going to be about who's right. This marriage is going to be about what's right. Many times people fall out trying to be right, meaning I'm right and you're wrong. No, it's what's right and that's the word of God. If I'm pleasing in the sight of God and faithful to God and doing right by God according to his word, I'm gonna do right by my spouse. If the wife is doing right by God being faithful according to the word of God, she's going to do right by her husband. That's automatic. That's success right there. We got the blueprint. It's not who's right. It's what's right. Put the word of God as the priority over every area of your life, every area of your marriage. I guarantee you success. But the Bible lets us know. Let's look at 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back to Ephesians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. See, remember, this is the blueprint. The word of God is the blueprint. And if we'll follow the blueprint, we'll have great success. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. See, this is where a lot of us go astray or get off track. You saved, but you want to get married to somebody who's not saved. You talking about making a mistake. You fixing to marry the enemy. You're going to be sleeping with the enemy. I don't care how much you love them. You're not, you don't have the same mind. One has a mind of Christ and the other has the mind of this world. And the Lord tells us to be separate and come out from among them. We're fixing to see it. Second Corinthians chapter six, verse number 14. The Lord said, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For, then he asks a question, is, is to, to uh, rhetorical questions, to ration, for you to rationalize with yourself and come to the answer yourself. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? The answer is none. So why would you marry somebody that you're not going to have fellowship with? always marry in the Lord. And then the person can understand, yes, it's not going to be about who's right. You, you're right. It's going to be about what's right because I love the Lord too. That's how it would be. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Tell me what fellowship do the Lord Jesus Christ have with the devil? You see? None. Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel, which is an unbeliever? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Verse 17, wherefore come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you and will be a father unto you and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now this goes beyond the unequal yoke just in marriage. It's in many things, business. You have to be careful how you deal with people that are, don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't want to become uh, yoked up with them. Watch the company you keep. The Bible says evil communication corrupt good manners. You see? The Bible also says how can two walk together except they agree? You always want to marry in the Lord. 
if we do remember the blueprint now this is Cor Corinth, Second Corinthians, First Corinthians. Paul was talking and said, and, and to the unmarried, you know, com I say command I, not the Lord. And we went on down through there. And by the time we get to the second epistle to to the Corinth, he said, don't marry outside of the Lord. But if we we'll do what the Lord said in Ecclesiastes chapter twelve, Ecclesiastes chapter twelve. Before you even get to marrying age. Teach your children this. Ecclesiastes 12 and 1. Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. So before you even get to marrying age. Come to the Lord. Then he says what? While the evil days come not nor the years draw now when thou shalt say I have no pleasure in them. While you're young, come to the Lord where you can serve him. That's what this is talking about, where you can serve him in your youth. Now, <clears throat> that will also mean that if you ran into somebody else, so you're a young man and you, you came to the Lord in your youth, you're serving the Lord, you're 15, 16 years old, whatever the case may be, and you grown up and now here you are in your early 20s and you done, you've met a woman, a young lady, She's 18, 19, 20 years old, and she's serving the Lord as well. What a wonderful opportunity that is to have a successful marriage and a successful life governed by the spirit of the living God. Hmm? Instead of seeing something you like and you're supposed to be a child of God and you running off after this and getting into an unequally yoked situation, which ends in divorce a bunch of strife, court battles, custody battles. You see, wonderful savior. The devil gets all kinds of glory in situations where God is not glorified and honored according to his word, where God's plan is not followed. When God's word is not adhered to, Satan gets glory. He finds ways to cause all kinds of confusion because he's the author of it. Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter five, and uh, I'm not gonna read the whole chapter, but I wanna point your attention to something. Uh, if you would read from verse one, he's talking to the church at Ephesus, down through verse number 21, this is all talking about the church congregation, right? Let's pick up at verse uh, 14. He says, Ephesians 5 and 14, talking to the church. Wherefore, he saith, awake thou that sleepest and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly. I mean, be very careful in your Christian walk. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Where the problem comes in it is that when we get to verse 22, verse 21 says, submitting yourselves one to another. That's dealing with the church. In the church, I'm an elder. And I shouldn't have a problem picking up the trash. I shouldn't have a problem, and I don't, being of service to someone who may just be, uh, who may be a lay member. You see, I, I'm willing and ought to be willing to submit myself to serve somebody else. We see it where Jesus washed Peter's feet. Peter said, oh, no, 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 Lord. You're not going to wash my feet. The Lord said, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. 
Peter said, well, Lord, if that's going to be the case, I'm going to wash my head and my hands. And in other words, just give me a bath then. The Lord said, you don't need that, nothing but that I wash your feet. In other words, then he goes on to say, he said, if I being your Lord and master will wash your feet, he says, then ye ought to wash one another's feet, submitting yourselves one to another. That's what feet washing is part of this service one to another. Help us one to another. No man ought to think of himself more highly than he ought to. That's what verse 21 is talking about amongst the church members. Verse 22, Ephesians 5 and 22, he is now dealing with marriage now. He's coming and bringing it down to the home. Where it says, wives... Submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. That means you submit to your husband just like you would submit to Jesus Christ. That's what the scripture is saying. This is why, again, make sure you don't have an unequally yoked marriage. Marry in the Lord. When you marry in the Lord, you can submit to a man like you would submit to the Lord because he is a man of God and he will love you like Jesus Christ loves his bride, the church. He won't abuse you. He won't take advantage of you. He will obey the Lord Jesus Christ and not operate in his headship over the wife from his flesh or from some position of ego. He's willing to say, baby, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? Wonderful Savior. If he's a true man of God now. This is why it's so important to marry in the Lord. And you need to watch these people and make sure that they are truly saved. You know, wonderful Savior. Well, bless his name or you end up in a situation. But, but the problem that I've seen people say they'll... Here, verse 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husband as unto the Lord. And then they'll say, but it's verse 21 says, submit one to another. That's a contradiction. How can you submit one to another and then only the wife in verse 22 is to submit to her husband? If it's submitting one to another, it would have been a verse 23 that said, and husbands submit to your wives as unto the Lord. You got to have understanding. And a lot of times people don't want to do. Brothers, let me tell you this here. Women, got to, they got to be careful who they marry. Women, you got to be careful who you marry. Make sure he's a man of God. That way you don't put yourself under the headship of someone who operates from their ego or out of their flesh. Or who's on some kind of power trip. Bless the name of the Lord. Brothers, make sure that you marry a woman who is submitted to the will of God and full of the power of the Holy Ghost as well. You see, who's not going to do what her flesh wants to do because in the fall, Genesis chapter three, Eve and by default, all the daughters of Eve end up with a spirit of rebellion against headship because whatever spirit deceives you, that's the spirit you become of. Remember, Satan, he rose up against God. He didn't want to stay in the place that God put him. He didn't want to stay there. He comes now in the form of a serpent and deceives Eve. And we're going to look and see what the Lord said. To the woman after their fall. Genesis chapter 3. And uh, we're going to look at verse number. Thirteen. And the Lord God said. Genesis 3 and 13. The Lord God said unto the woman. What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said the serpent beguiled me the serpent deceived me and i did eat i ate of that fruit 
And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field, upon thy belly that shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. There's something in there. Uh, the Lord asked the man, What is this you have done? The man answered, said, A woman you gave me. He asked the woman, What is this you have done? She said, A serpent beguiled me. But notice how the Lord dealt with the serpent. He didn't ask. He didn't say, Serpent, what is this you have done? He judged it right there. That's a lesson to us. We don't uh, mess around with sin, no way, no how. If it's of the devil, we judge it to be not, a, not of God and we rebuke it. We don't say, Well, what is this? And look at it and see if we can figure it out. No, it's not of God. Leave it alone. Wonderful Savior. Wonderful Savior. Verse 14, look how the Lord dealt with the serpent. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, because thou hast done this. He didn't say, serpent, what is this you have done? He said, because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field upon thy belly. Shalt thou go and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. That's the seed of the woman. And thou shalt bruise his heel unto the woman. He said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Here it is, y'all. And thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Many people will say that this headship that God gave the man is because of sin. No. Before sin came in, in Genesis chapter 2, God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. The helper is not the head before sin came in. But when, what, what happened was when sin came in, now the helper don't want to stay a helper. She now wants to be the head. That's what it means when he said, and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he shall rule over thee. We see the same thing in Genesis chapter four when God warns Cain. Where is it at? Genesis chapter four. And in verse number seven, the Lord is talking to Cain. Verse six, and the Lord said unto Cain, why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door and unto thee shall be his desire. Sin wants to rule over you. Then he says, and thou shalt rule over him. You see, same language. You're supposed to rule over sin, Cain, and the man is to rule over his wife, but in love, wonderful Savior. And the helper was always going to be a helper and had no problem with it. But when sin came in, she is deceived by the devil, the same one whose spirit was he did not want to stay where God put him. So now he deceives the woman and the woman now takes that on to where she's just not satisfied with being the helper. She don't want, she don't want the man to be her head. Wonderful Savior. Back in Ephesians chapter 5, it's the word of God, period. So men be very careful to not marry a woman who has that uh, spirit active working and not yield herself over to the Lord. You'll be marrying a Jezebel. Oh, bless his name. And now you're talking about some trouble on your hand, buddy. <laughs> oh, glory. Ephesians chapter 5 and at verse number 22, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Just like Jesus Christ is the head of the church, the husband is the head of the wife. And he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, tell me when is the church, the church ever told Jesus Christ, you ain't my daddy. You can't tell me what to do. When the church ever tell Jesus that? Well, a wife should never tell her husband that. And I'm going to deal with the husbands here in just a second. Because I can hear the women now. Well, what about the husband? Just wait. I get to him. <laughs> oh, bless his name. Verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. 
This is why you must marry a man who is full of the power of the Holy Ghost in the Lord. That way you, you, you're safe in being subject unto him. You're, you're in a safe place. You don't have to be on pins and needles. You're free. You're covered. Oh, bless his name. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Christ's whole purpose was to die for his church, his bride. Look what it says, verse 26, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The, the way a man is, loved to, is to love his wife as Christ loved the church, what that looks like is leading her into the kingdom, treating her just like Christ treats the church. Christ does not give the his his church everything that they might ask for or want. He has some thou shalt nots in there. You have to be able to tell your wife no on certain things. But let it not be because you're on a power trip. Let it be because you have the spirit of the living God in you and being the head, you can see that this was going to get in the way of us getting to the kingdom of God, baby. A man's love for his wife is going to be when it looks like the love that Christ has for his church is going to be about getting her and leading her into the kingdom of God. And you can't lead her into the kingdom of God unless you go in there yourself. You got to be a man of God before you can love your wife like Christ loved the church. Because that's love there when you're concerned about the soul of a person. Oh, bless his name. You want your wife to enter into the kingdom of God with you. So that means you're going to you're going to be the head of your house. According to scripture, you're going to rule your house according to scripture. That's going to be loving your wife as Christ loved the church. You're going to be you're not going to mistreat her. You're not going to abuse her. Wonderful savior. You're going to be governed and governed by the Spirit of God. You're going to be governed by the Spirit of God, and you're going to govern by the Spirit of God. That's loving your wife as Christ loved the church. If you're not doing that, you're dead wrong, and you need to repent. Wonderful Savior. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he, this is why, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. We want to make that happen. We don't want to get in the way of our wives being presented in the, as a, in the body of Christ to the Lord wonderful savior that he might present it to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that it should be holy and without blemish so ought men to love their wives see as their own bodies you wouldn't do your own body wrong don't do your wife wrong like you care for your own self care for your wife just the same so all men to love their wives their own bodies he that loveth his wife loveth himself for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth. See, you're going to nourish that woman and cherisheth it. You're going to cherish her because she's a gift from the Lord, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too shall be one flesh. This was before the fall, y'all. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife. See that you make sure that you reverence. That means you respect your husband and the wife. See that she reverence her husband. Wonderful Savior. I hope this is a help to you. I'm a witness as to what living according to the word of God and having a marriage that is governed by the word of God. I'm a witness as to what that looks like and how wonderful it is. 
going on 12 years strong in my own marriage and I thank the Lord for it and it didn't however long we got left to live breath in our body we're gonna get stronger and stronger me and my wife gonna get stronger and stronger and stronger in the Lord and anybody else that submits to the will of God will be able to have that same testimony marry in the Lord wonderful Savior hope this was a blessing to you uh, it's a blessing to me and uh, I thank the Lord for you all. Remember to share these messages. Uh, subscribe, if you will, and, and like the messages. It helps YouTube get it out because we need the Word of God. Uh, we need it according to the Word of God with knowledge and understanding. Well, God bless y'all. And until next, next time, y'all keep the faith.